Good afternoon. Welcome to our September 2019 webinar from ACU Idea Lab. We're grateful you're able to join us today, most likely on your lunch break at work. And these webinars will be recorded and available on our Idea Lab YouTube site, which will be emailed to you at the conclusion of today's session. On our main website, acuidealab.com, you can also learn more about what we do for professional development. If you would like more information on our online degree programs, please visit acu.edu forward slash online. All of our online degree programs are designed for working professionals like yourself. Today, we will hear from Lisa Hancock, who I will introduce momentarily. I am Noelle Ewan, and I'm your host this afternoon. You will notice that all participants are muted and hidden, but there will be opportunities to participate in today's session, as well as ask questions using the chat function found at the bottom of your Zoom window. Let's begin using that chat with everyone sharing their name and city and state they're joining from. Here is today's agenda. Ms. Hancock will present on the Enneagram Advantage, the power of knowing yourself for personal and professional growth. I will close this out no later than 1245 with some next step items, and we welcome anyone who would like to stay after for a Q&A with Ms. Hancock. During this webinar, you will gain exposure to the vast body of wisdom the Enneagram has to offer. You'll learn what sets the Enneagram apart from other personality typing systems. You'll explore the different perspective each number brings to life and discover how components of the Enneagram create opportunities for personal growth, dispute resolution, team building, and staff development. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker sharing some of her expertise with us today. Lisa Hancock is a conflict resolution specialist and sought after guest speaker whose work promotes dispute resolution, problem solving, and team building. In 2007, she earned a Master of Arts in Dispute Resolution from SMU. Today, as Director of Restorative Communications, Lisa performs mediations, teaches workshops, and writes Enneagram curriculum. She also serves as an adjunct professor at SMU and facilitate workshops at ACU's Duncombe Sitter Solutions. I'm happy to welcome Lisa Hancock. Happy September 19th, everyone. I'm so glad to be here, Noel. Thank you. Today is a special day to me for two reasons. The first is that I'm here presenting the Enneagram to you. And the second is it is my 38th wedding anniversary. So 38 years ago, I married the most wonderful man, Jim Hancock. My challenge today is to introduce a vast body of wisdom in 45 minutes. I'll be moving quickly, and I want you to know up front that this is not a discover your number workshop. That takes all day. Today is to give you a taste of the Enneagram and all that it has to offer. I've chosen six words to help you, uh, to help represent each Enneagram number, and as we go, I'm going to be building context around these words with explanations and stories. So before we begin, I want to share something with you that I believe is true for me. The quality of the relationship that we have with ourselves is the foundation upon which we live our entire life. I want to say that one more time because I think it's that important. The quality of the relationship that we have with ourselves is the foundation upon which we live our entire life life. Don't you think that we owe it to ourselves and those that we work with and those that we love to become more self-aware and to grow our souls? Well, obviously, I think we do. So the Enneagram also teaches us that we were each born with the spark of the divine in us. And when we get to know ourselves better, we strengthen our connection to God. So let's get started. What is the Enneagram advantage? Well, one thing that it tells us is why do people do the things they do? Why are we all so different? Why do we get along with some people and not others? And what is your preferred work style? It can also tell us what type of work that we're drawn to, what our leadership style is, 
and how we can leverage our strengths at work and home associated with each Enneagram number. So I think we have our first poll question coming up next. So what I'm wanting to know is how familiar are you with the Enneagram on a scale of one to five? And I get that one is, is that you know nothing. This is your first time to ever hear anything, see anything about it. And five is that you probably know your Enneagram number and you're very familiar. Just want to get a feel for what, your, what my audience is out there. Give you a few seconds for this and then give you some feedback. Oh, and it looks like ah, we have more that are familiar with it than unfamiliar with it, but we have a lot in between too. So good, good. We're, let's, we've got a lot more to learn. So let's talk about what sets the Enneagram apart from other personality typing systems. The first is that it's time tested. We believe that the Enneagram is thousands of over 2,000 years old. So it's been tested by time. We know that it works. The second thing is that it shows us the limitations and how to address them. And some Enneagram teachers say it shows us where we're broken and what we need to do to heal. But the thing that I think is the most important is that unlike other personality typing systems, the Enneagram is focused on our motivation, not our behavior. Now, motivation drives behavior, but motivation is the root. It's the why you do the things that you do. And that is the only way that we can make lasting change is if we, if we can determine what our motivation is. So we're getting to the real root of what the problem is or the behavior that we're trying to get rid of or why we do. It's the motivation is the why. So I want you to, to look, you're gonna see the screen again, but I want you to just look at these words. And if you could describe yourself in one word before we get to all of the other stuff that we have in 45 minutes, what word would you choose? Now, um, let's do a little housekeeping here because this is important as we go through the rest, the rest of our time together. These are the things that I want you to keep in mind to enhance your Enneagram experience today. We keep our core Enneagram number our entire life. Our Enneagram number isn't a type of person, but it's a path to self-discovery and personal growth. And the descriptions are universal and they apply to males and females and across all cultures. Not all of what I share with you today concerning each Enneagram type is gonna fit. Some are gonna apply some of the time and maturity and stress make a, make a big difference when you're looking through the lens of an Enneagram. No one number is better or worse than another and we all have some aspects of all nine numbers in us to some degree. If you have taken a test to determine your Enneagram number, I have found that they are more confusing than helpful. So what I want you to do is put that aside and um, come back to it after we're through, but come with an open mind. And finally, two more things that will help you in discerning um, your Enneagram type. If you can take this information in through the lens of when you were 20 years old, that would be really helpful. And you're probably wondering why. Some of you are 20. Some of you, are like me, are on the way other side of 20. And here's why. Because when you were 20, the most important thing in your life was you. What you wanted, what you, what you liked, what you wanted to do. Life hadn't taken off the edges or beat you up quite so much yet. So this is pure information about you. And secondly, I want you to consider this information when you were home. Think about when you were 20 years old and when you were home, because when you're at home, you are the most relaxed. So think about taking this, all of this in and pay special attention to the motivation of each number. So if you're ready, let's start a tour of the nine Enneagram numbers. And I'm going to start with eight because eights would want me to start with them and we call the eights the boss 
sometimes we call them the challenger, and their motivation is to avoid being controlled. Okay, pay attention to that. Your moti the motivation that I give you with each number is probably the most important thing for you to remember. So let's put some bones around this. This number has the most energy of all the Enneagram numbers. They are direct and authoritative. Their directness can intimidate people. They're big in the room and they have a larger than life presence and they will step into a leadership role like they own it if there is a vacuum or a void in leadership. They're protective. They have a soft spot for the underdog, but they can also have a difficult time expressing it because they don't want to appear vulnerable. So I want to share this story with you. I live in Dallas in front of kind of a busy street. At the end of my street is a 7-Eleven that has been there quite a while. And I want you to know it's kind of a pitiful 7-Eleven. It's really old. It's got two gas station bays. And a couple of years ago, a big giant QT went up next, right next door. So it's got 24 bays. It's got clean bathrooms. It's got pizza, a slice of pizza for a dollar. It's got that good crushed ice. I mean, there's no reason why you wouldn't go into the QT over the 7-Eleven. Well, I have a nephew who is 20 years old. And he went into the 7-Eleven one day and started chatting with the owners. And he found out that they're immigrants from another country and that they own that 7-Eleven. So it's privately owned and that they're real worried about their business. The QT has taken away their, um, a lot of their business and they're suffering for it. And so my sweet nephew, who as I said, as an aide on the Enneagram, asked everyone in our family if we wouldn't mind filling up the 7-Eleven rather than the QT so that we could help this family. So there's a real soft spot for the underdog. You just might not always see it with eights. They are aggressive. They test everyone. And this is how they figure out your boundaries. They build trust by pushing you and debating. This can look like anger, but they tell me it's not anger. They tell me it's passion. So if you work or you work with or you love an eight, match their energy and intensity because they'll respect you for it. And it's the only way that they can hear what you're saying. Now, remember, their motivation is to not be controlled. So their focus is not necessarily to control you. They just don't want you controlling them. So they've got a real funny thing about the controlling thing. And they can seem insensitive because they're energized by disagreements and conflict. They like to test their strength. And this passionate show of emotions can seem heavy and difficult to be around. And they're surprised when they find out people think they're intimidating. Because, you know, they just think they're being themselves. An eight once told me that her motto is, may the bridges I burn light your way. That's the eights. Let's move on to the nines. We call the nine the peacemaker. Some people call them the mediator because their motivation is to avoid conflict. And this number is the least complicated number on the Enneagram with the least amount of physical energy. These good people are agreeable, patient, and receptive. They merge with others because, they, because it takes less energy. They believe that their personal agenda will threaten the harmony of the group, so they tend to be able to see both sides of the situation, like a mediator or a peacemaker. And as leaders, they are inclusive. Nines will take the time to make sure that everybody is heard and has a place at the table. And I know, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a mediator to me. They're also very stubborn. The more you push them, the more they tend to withdraw. They just don't want to be affected by your stuff. If you want nines to do something, how you ask them is important. They don't like pressure and they don't like expectations. They can appear apathetic because they can spin on habit for years. Typically, nines have little interest in, interest in changing jobs frequently. Um, that lack of interest in, in enthusiasm 
also allows them to fall asleep to their lives and personal growth. And they're forgetful. They can forget that their presence matters. And these people are really important to us. Those are nines. Ones. The perfectionist. And their motivation is to be perfect. And here, this number has a deal breaker that no other number has. So hear me when I say this. Ones have a relentless inner critic. 24-7 that sounds like this. You're not working hard enough. You didn't do a good job on that project. You aren't good enough. You should have done this. There's lots of judgy words, should, could, ought, that kind of thing. Now, we all have a certain amount of negative self-talk, and this is not what a one experiences. A one has a uh, inner critic that never stops. So 24-7, they hear negative feedback all the time, and it's exhausting. Nine, uh, ones are also ethical. They have high internal standards that they impose on the world. They're self-disciplined and hard workers. They do well in jobs where they can identify flaws or determine the most efficient process. They're productive. And because they can't control the inner critic, they look for people and other things to control. Their homes and their workplaces are well-ordered, clean, and organized. Ones have to-do lists that they love to check off, and ones reload the dishwasher. They can be judgmental and difficult to please because they have high expectations, not only for, for you, but also for themselves. And expectations are just resentment waiting to happen. They're inflexible and rigid. They believe almost everything out there is flawed and they put unrealistic pressure on themselves to be the one to fix it. So when ones walk into a room, they immediately find the flaws, the, the, the uh, picture that's a little bit crooked, the dust on, on the desk, the books that are out of place. And if you love a one, take them on vacation because they're overly serious and they need some fun in their lives. And while they're away, they can relax when they're not looking for imperfections in their own homes and workplaces. Those are ones. Let's move to the two. The helper. And their motivation is to be needed. And I could also add loved because needed and loved are synonymous for twos. And this is the most sensitive to criticism of all the Enneagram numbers. They're loving. Their self-worth comes from seeing and meeting the needs of others. And if you use the word need with the two, you've got them hooked. That word is their kryptonite. They will do anything. They're intuitive and tuned into others. They make a great second in command. Their highly developed interpersonal skills mean that they instinctively read people and work with people to build community. And their cheerleading means that they get the best that people have to offer. They're possessive because they're so relationship oriented and people oriented. They want to be your special friend and that can make them seem clingy and they can be jealous if they are not your special coworker or confidant. And they can suffer like a martyr because they give and they give and they give until they're empty. And then when they're unhealthy, they will blame you for their over-functioning. There's your twos. Let's move on to threes. The performer, some people call them the achiever. And their motivation is to succeed. Threes are confident, good, solid leaders. They know how to motivate other people. They're industrious and efficient, and they're great at multitasking. They even tell me that they work better 
when they're doing several things at once. Threes never call in sick, and they can be workaholics. So if you think about it, work is where they can excel and get recognized for their efforts. Work is where they can succeed. They're image conscious. They're concerned with what you think of them, and they will put time and energy into crafting an image that they think you will admire. They also are superficial. And when I'm, what I mean by that is they're personable. They're personal, but not personable. They tend to say too little about themselves rather than too much. You may never really know a three on a deep, intimate level because they are not going to share something with you that they think is going to make them appear less than successful. They are overly competitive. They tell me they have two mottos, and they are, here's the first one, get to the top and look good doing it. And the second one is first place is the only place that counts, and second place is the first loser. And let me say that some of us feel real comfortable when we're hearing talk about a three. And if you live in Dallas, that's one of the reasons, because Dallas is a three city. And if you're not from Dallas and you feel comfortable, it is because the Uni Un United States is a three country. So this, these are the waters that we swim in. Let's move to fours. We call fours the individualist, or some people say the romantic, and their motivation is to be special. They are they, there are, by the way, there are less fours in the world than any other number. These people are truly unique individuals. We think there's about, we think about 5% of the population are fours. They're expressive. They speak in terms of feelings rather than thoughts and actions. They make an effort to connect and understand those they work with because it makes their work life richer. So if you work with a four, take the time to connect with them on a deeper level. They're also dramatic. They're comfortable with melancholy and sad stories. And their depth and intensity allow them to go to a more meaningful place than the rest of us when discussing important topics. They're compassionate and caring. They're comfortable with bearing witness to the pain of others. And this is important without being scared or needing to fix it. And my son is a four, and this is something that he has taught me that I would have never known, is how to sit with someone who is hurting or needs help and not overfunction to allow them to come up with their own ideas of what they need. They're withdrawn. Their sense of specialness makes them feel set apart from others and different. And they tell me that they have never felt understood or felt like they fit in, even as young children. And that alone right there can cause them to withdraw. They're moody. They have complicated and intense mood swings many times a day. And if you have a four in your life, sometimes you never know what you're going to get. Is it the up and happy four, or is it the down and depressed four? Self-conscious, they tell me they long to be recognized, seen, and listened to. They want you to try to get to know them for who they are. And being understood is everything to a four. And you've got to know that if you have a four in your life, you're important to them because relationships are important to a four. Let's move to the observer, the five. And their motivation is to understand. And this is the most, most emotionally detached of all the Enneagram numbers. And here's what I mean by that. They interact with the world through their minds. It's not that they don't have emotions. It's that they use their minds when interacting with others. These 
these people can be isolated and private individuals. They don't want to rely on others and they safeguard their independence by gathering information and being informed. They're objective and they think and observe their way through challenges rather than feel their way through challenges. And they use analytical knowledge instead of emotions. When you ask them how they feel, they'll tell you what they think. And that doesn't mean that they don't have feelings. It simply means they need time to access them. So if you work with a, with a five or you love a five and you ask them how they feel and they, they tell you what they think, circle back and say, I know what you think. Now tell me how you feel and give them time to come up with what that is. They can appear secretive. These people like their doors shut. They, at, they may not attend social functions or initiate encounters. And they feel as if they don't have enough inner resources. So they leave their homes in the morning with a finite amount of energy to expend. And I want you to hear me when I say this, every social encounter, every handshake, Every phone call costs them something, and their job is to get home at the end of the day before the energy runs out so that they can fill back up for the next day. I uh, got a call this summer from a medium-sized company, and the owner called me and said, I need you to come out and do a mediation, and I, I'm always... It, you know, doing intake. Okay, tell me, give me a little more information. And he said, we have a woman who has, she's an employee that has been with me the very longest. She's our top producer, but she's poisoning. And he used that word. She's poisoning our corporate culture. And I said, okay, tell me a little bit more. And he said, well, she doesn't attend any of our uh, company happy hours. She doesn't come to our company Christmas parties. When we have group lunches, she stays in her room. She closes the door to her office. She uses headphones. When you walk in to ask her a question, she acts like she's really put out by that. And people are just distracted by it. They can't work with her. They, she's just difficult. And, you know, I've been studying the Enneagram for seven years, and I thought, I wonder what the Enneagram, what this woman's Enneagram number is. So instead of a mediation, I talked the owner of the company into letting me do an all day discover your, your number workshop where I worked with everybody in his, in the, in the corporate office so that they could know their Enneagram numbers. And this woman was a five on the Enneagram. It wasn't that she was poisoning the corporate culture. It wasn't that she was trying to be difficult. In fact, she was, as I said, the number one producer. She had been at this company for the longest 10 years. And, um, and so when, when we, they sat through the whole uh, day workshop and at the end of the day, I shared with this man what uh, her number was. He said, oh, that, oh, that answers it. Okay, so now this woman, because of, she knows her Enneagram and her boss does too, it creates more compassion for, for people. People just get things about you that they wouldn't have understood earlier. So this woman is now working from home. She comes at Monday through Thursday. She comes into the office on Friday and um, so that she can make a round and show everybody she's a team player. But because she's working from home and there's no distractions and she's happier, her productivity is up 25%. Now, you know, you've got to hear this. He was even considering firing her. She had, she was poisoning the corporate culture and all because she didn't fit into what this company had in mind as far as just, uh, uh, you know, an employee, fun and gregarious and showing up to be a team player. She was being a team player by working hard. So uh, just more good reasons to know what your uh, coworkers, what number your coworkers are. Okay. These uh, fives can also be, uh, appear stingy. They hoard time and money. 
and even affection or whatever it takes to live an independent life. And because they don't rely on others, they can have an inflated sense of their own abilities to think objectively through a project or a problem at work and home. It can make them appear intellectually arrogant. There's your fives. Let's move on to sixes. And we call the six the questioner. And their motivation is to feel secure. And we think there are more sixes in the world than any other number. Uh, I've been taught that at least 50% of us are sixes. So think about that. There are, most of us need to feel secure. These people are responsible and loyal. They are loyal team players. They won't quit a job or give up over a situation or problem that most people would. They're practical. Their hard work and dedication to causes while following the rules holds their team and their organization together. They're clear-headed and focused in a crisis, and they do well in jobs where they work with symptoms and flaws or processes that need improvement. They know upgrades that need to be made because they're, they've already thought through worst-case scenario. Sixes think the world is a dangerous place, and they must be prepared for anything in order to survive. So another quick story. I'm having lunch this summer with a friend who's a six, and we're sitting across from each other. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, how good it is to be with her. I haven't seen her in a long time, and it's just, this just makes me feel good to be sitting across from her and catching up. And so I asked her, I said, tell me what you're thinking, because I'm wanting to tell her I miss you. And she said, and the, only a six would say this. She said, I'm sitting here and I'm watching the front door because I'm wondering, I'm planning out, is what she said, where we would go if somebody came in through the front door and was shooting people. Now, I almost, I, I almost couldn't believe what I was hearing, but I know enough about sixes and I know I knew that she was a six, so I said, tell me a little bit more. And she said, uh, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking that we would either go under the table or we would run around the table and go in through the kitchen and there would have to be an entrance to an alley or something and we could get away quickly. Now, that's another reason why uh, relationships are richer and deeper with the Enneagram because you can sit across from friends and things like that just don't seem crazy. You kind of get it when you hear these things because this is, what, this is the way sixes think. They're always preparing for the worst case scenario. And they can be self-defeating or self-sabotaging because they doubt themselves. They're always looking for an authority figure for courage and advice. They seek courage to go through life. But what I think what they really need is faith. They need faith in themselves and faith in the goodness of others. Sixes feel, uh, work hard to stay in control and vigilant and to prepare for the worst. So they find comfort in routine. They don't like chaos and disruptions, and they long for rules and predictability to feel safe. I, when I imagine a six, I imagine a lone security guard in a watchtower looking over the horizon with a pair of binoculars, trying to spot danger before it happens to keep the rest of us safe. And if you work with a six or you love a six, know that this is what they are doing for themselves and this is what they're doing for you. Sixes. So let's move on to sevens. And we call sevens the enthusiasts, but we also can call them the Epicurean. Epicurean because they want to taste all that life has to offer. And their motivation is to avoid pain. And this number, sevens, are the most extroverted number on the Enneagram. They love being the center of attention. They're spontaneous. You know, I bet a, I bet a seven came up with the acronym FOMO, fear of missing out. And I bet they also came up with the line of clothing, life is good. 
they're charming and fun loving you know a seven breathes energy into a room with their positivity and light I think a seven is a party looking for a place to happen and I don't think a party is a party without a seven so I have a daughter who is a seven and she is a teacher and she is the first one to volunteer for the dunking booth at the elementary school she works works at or the pie throwing booth and she's been known to do both at the school carnival now what teacher would sign up for that and I'm telling you a teacher that's a seven they're un they can also be undisciplined. They can indulge in risky or unhealthy behaviors in order to not feel pain. And these behaviors could be overeating or drinking or spending too much money, all to forget the pains associated with life. Because limitations are so hard for sevens. I've asked them, when is enough enough? And they tell me too much is almost enough. They're restless. They live their entire life anticipating the next big thing. And they tell me anticipation is better than the event itself because repetition can bring boredom. And they can appear scattered as they jump from project to project and all this busyness to fill a void and overcome emptiness. I have a dear friend who is a seven. He's older. I think he's 75. And he was bored with his with his job and so he decided that he was going to go to all the national parks in one year now okay he's 75 years old so in one year he visited all the national parks when that was done in two months he visited all the presidential libraries when that was done he took the next two months and he played golf in every state and then he visited each state capital in three months and he wanted me to tell you all of this while he was working full time unbelievable right unhealthy sevens can appear narcissistic they can become self-absorbed and have a long, a long line of jobs that they quit or relationships that they've given up on or uh, you know, projects that just never got done and their need to refuse to deal with sadness and pain lead them to abandon people and things when they aren't happy or when the going gets tough there my friends is a tour of the nine numbers so how about we go back and look at this matchup and the and I'm sure you know 45 minutes ago you saw this and you might have picked one and I'm wondering which one you would pick now because what we're going to do is we're going to match these up with the Enneagram numbers that they relate to. So ones are good, twos loving, threes effective, fours original, fives are wise, sixes loyal, sevens joyful, eights powerful, and nines peaceful. So I think we have our next polling question coming up and I'm wondering which Enneagram number that you lean towards and perhaps you know your Enneagram number and that's great but maybe you can eliminate some and maybe in this short amount of time something just struck you and you know exactly which one you fit into so if you would take a second and just answer this polling question I'll tell you what the results were Okay, ah, so tw only 12% of you were able to, uh, don't know or aren't really sure what their number is, but it looks like more of us are the perfectionist than any other number, followed by in close uh, second and third with sevens, nines, and twos. And just like we knew, fours, there's less fours than any other uh, numbers. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, in wrapping up, I want you to consider the Enneagram as far as bringing out the best in yourself, but also being able to use it as a business tool for personal development. Look at leadership. Our motivation determines our leadership style. Do we lead and manage in ways that others can follow? 
Hmm. The Enneagram helps with that. How about professional development? Are people in the right jobs using their gifts and talents effectively? Are you leveraging your strengths to the greatest of your ability? And how about, are you able to manage your blind spots and certainly improve relationships? You know, I told you 45 minutes ago that I've been married 38 years and I will tell you the last five have been easier because we both know our Enneagram numbers and we're using Enneagram language to enhance our marriage. Also, my children know their numbers. I would have parented them differently if I had known the Enneagram all those years ago. And I certainly understand my, my friends better. Um, team development, too. You can um, bring out the best in yourself. Imagine your team that you work with or your team uh, at home. Imagine how strong and effective you all could be if you understood yourself and each other better. And certainly we've been talking about personal growth a lot here today. Remember, our motivation determines our behavior. We can't make changes when we're blind to our weaknesses and what motivates us. And dispute resolution. This is why as a mediator, I have found that it's vital to understand how people in conflict show up in a room. I think I know because of the Enneagram that I'm a more confident and effective peacemaker. And finally, creating a culture of consciousness. You know, the Enneagram is being used in organizations to inspire employees to ensure that their actions are more conscious, effective, and supportive of the greater good. And I think we need more of this in our world. We need more self-awareness. We need more people that are willing to do this deeper work to make the world a better place to live in. In summary, I'd want, I want to wrap it up by saying that the Enneagram gives us tools to grow both personally and professionally. And knowing our Enneagram number helps us know so much more about ourselves and others. And there are nine ways of seeing the world. And you, we can't do anything about the way that we see the world. It's the way we're wired. But we can do something about what we, but we can do something about what we do with what we see. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And we will open up for Q and A shortly. Uh, while you're thinking of questions for Lisa, uh, you'll see a link posted in the chat for anyone interested in finding out more about our online degree programs. And you will receive an email within the next 24 hours with a uh, recording of today's session, including a brief survey. And we would appreciate your feedback as we continue these webinars in the future. We would also like to invite you to ACU Online's Open House webinar next week on Thursday, September 6th at 6.30 p.m. to learn more about the online undergraduate and graduate programs offered at ACU Online. We're also posting a registration link in the chat for that event. If you do have further questions, feel free to email us at idealab at acu.edu. And we want to sincerely thank everyone for joining us and a special thank you again to Lisa Hancock for sharing your knowledge with us today. We will we'll now open it up for Q&A, so feel free to type your questions in the chat. Uh, please note there is a drop down window for you to choose all panelists and attendees. Be sure to choose that before posting your questions so that Lisa is able to see it. Okay, I'm looking, I've got some great, um, great uh, uh, messages from people. And what is the motivation for uh, nine and one? So the motivation for a nine is to avoid conflict. And the motivation for a one is to be perfect. And Lisa, it looks like someone posted um, in a chat that you may not be able to see. She said, uh, how do you decide which number you are if you lean towards two numbers, for example, oh. seven and eight? Okay. So I think that's a great question. I know I can't see that. So let me, let me say this. I think that um, it, 
that's not unusual to lean towards two numbers that are next to each other simply because, uh, but I do want you to go back to the motivation. And the reason that um, it can, you can have two numbers where you're having a difficult time deciding that are next to each other is because the numbers on either side of your core Enneagram number are called your wings. And wings are the home of your secondary desires. So very often um, you can, it, it, you can have that number seem like it's bigger than your core number. For, for instance, when I um, decided what my, in, my core Enneagram number was, the numbers on either side of my core Enneagram number, I'm just going to tell you, I'm a two. And ones and threes come really close. Uh, and those are the numbers on either side of my core number. I, I have a difficult time deciding between these three. And it's because one and three are my wings. And, um, but they, the motivation of a one and a three don't hit me like the motivation of a two to be needed. So that's, that's why a seven and an eight can seem like, uh, they're difficult to choose between. Um, is there, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to read a couple of these, if that's okay. Is there also an assessment that we can take to discover our number? Let me tell you that I have not found, I think that the, um, there's a READY test. It's R-H-E-T-I, and it's done by the Enneagram Institute. I think it's $12. That is the best online uh, Enneagram test there is. Again, it's about 65% accurate. It, you know, if you take it on a day that you are stressed out or you're going through a difficult time or you feel rushed, it takes about an hour, um, your, your answers are not going to be accurate. I believe that you cannot take uh, a, a quick test to discover your number. You've got to sit in a discover your number workshop that takes from like nine to four. And that way you can hear the stories, you can hear the context around each number, you can ask questions. And, um, and you just can't have that with an online test. What resources were used uh, to study the Enneagram? I apprenticed for three years under a woman named Suzanne Stabil. She's an Enneagram master and she uh, teaches here in the Dallas area. And I, so I apprenticed with her for three years, and then I had to teach in front of her in order to uh, sort of get her blessing to teach. She, uh, she teaches at, um, and gives uh, classes at a place called Life in the Trinity Ministry. And I also um, have Enneagram classes that go, uh, that are ongoing all the time that I teach places as well. Um, Let's see. Uh, let's see. So, um, has there been much research on how accurate Enneagram tests are or how much they co correlate to other established personality inventories? Yes. There is a book called The Enneagram Made Easy that is a great primer to starting uh, any kind of Enneagram um, uh, journey. And the reason is, is in the back. It's easy to read first, and in the back, they do the they lay the enneagram on top of other personality typing tests to show you how they correlate with each other. So that is that's wonderful. Um, so uh, we own a small business. Uh, what a great resource this would be for our managers and team, and it is. I I speak to companies all the time. Um, how much do you charge? Uh, Aunt, let me give you my email address and you can send me a, um, I'm Lisa Martin Hancock at gmail.com and we can talk about that there if that's okay. Let's see if there's any, I'm not getting all these, but let's see. Ah, what numbers are powerful, loving, and effective? Now, I think, that's a great question. I think all numbers are powerful, loving, and effective in their own way. When you, know, uh, when you know yourself, you can be more effective, you can be more powerful, and you can know how to love with no strings attached. For instance, uh, as a two, I can um, be very 
over, I can over function. And I know that. And so when I am parenting and when I am um, loving people, I, ab I absolutely know that I can step in and take over. And my relationships are better because I'm not doing that anymore. So I think all numbers are. Um, as a seven, I struggle with vulnerability. Do you, do you have any recommendations? Yes, I absolutely do. And I think that is um, whoever wrote that, bravo to you, because sevens have such a difficult time admitting to vulnerability simply because they don't want to feel pain. And, uh, and so they do whatever they need to do to avoid feeling pain. I'm going to always say this. I think everybody needs a good therapist and a good spiritual director because when you need one, you really need one. And as far as the vulnerability is concerned, I think the more that you get to know yourself, there's real power in being vulnerable because you know who you can trust and who you can't. And, and who you choose to be vulnerable with is so very, very important. And I think you're a healthy seven to be able to say that. So I hope that that was some uh, help to you as well. Uh, let's see. Any more? Um, okay. Ah, what about a six with PTSD? Yeah. That is, uh, I will tell you that PTSD childhood trauma, illnesses, other things make it, make everything, just make life more difficult. I think a six with, a, with PTSD is hard. And you've, when you think about um, needing to feel safe and having PTSD, uh, those are just two hard things to, to bump up against each other. I would say this. I would say that self-awareness in any way, shape, or form, um, and knowing what, with sixes, knowing what is safe and what isn't. My, uh, my sister is a six, and she has told me that it helps when I ask her, okay, let's talk about worst case scenario. What would you do? And so we talk our way through it. And she said when she gets to the end, she's got a game plan, and she doesn't feel so silly anymore. So I'm wondering if that would be helpful to you as well. And I, I hear you, and I get it. That's a really tough thing, those two things together. Um, any tips for how ones can manage their expectation of others? Yes. Yes. Um, Ones have a funny thing, and that is they're so tough on themselves and they expect so much of other people that I tell ones that expectations are resentment waiting to happen. So it's just a loop. It's, it's, a, it's a loop that ones get on that they just can't get off of. I'm, I, would, I would say that being aware that you do this is part of the awareness around behavior that isn't working for you is a big piece of it. I would also say that um, looking at expectations through the lens that it creates resentment with others might also be a little helpful. But remember that these are pat that we all have patterned unconscious behavior and it's not going to be something that just because we're aware of it, we're going to quit doing it. These are things that we have done for a long time. And obviously it served us sort of well because we keep doing it, right? Well, just shining light on it and catching yourself non-judgmentally catching yourself in this behavior is the first step to making changes and be gentle with yourself. Because when, these, when um, these behaviors come to light, when you finally see what you've been doing your whole life, most of us cringe. And most of us have that negative self-talk to some degree. But being kind and gentle and knowing that being tough on ourselves is not going to change anything is a 
uh, one of the ways that I would address the expectation piece and just knowing that it's going to take some time is another one. Um, let's see. I, um, uh, yeah, so somebody said ideas to focus on strengths of a person's number and not make fun of their motivation because in their family they say, oh, she does that because she's a... So when I teach the Enneagram, uh, one of the things I say is do no harm because once you discover someone's Enneagram number, you know a whole lot more about them and we never do anything to beat somebody over the head or to excuse bad behavior. Um, and so um, th that is something that is needs to be taken into consideration when you work with a when you when you know the numbers of people you work with or people in your family don't ever ever use it to hit them over the head with it's just not going to be um, it's not it's not good um, when I teach uh, the Enneagram as a uh, discover your number a whole day thing. We do talk about strengths. I just didn't have time um, to do all that today. But knowing a person's strength and not making fun of them is a huge piece of knowing everything about your number. And then somebody said, can a person's number change during their lifetime? And the answer is no. Uh, you're born, we say that you are born a, a third, a third, a third, a third of you is born wired a certain way, and then a certain amount is nature. So that's nature. A certain amount is nurture, the expectations put on you from others in your family and those that love you. And then a third is life experience. So you never change your core Enneagram number. But what you can do is live in your stress number, and that's a whole different workshop you can live for years in your stress number and look like you're a different number other than what you really are so that can make your number look different um, I'm thinking that's a I think there might be a few more but that's a pretty good representation you guys have answered their great great questions thank you well, thank you again, Lisa. This was a very um, intriguing topic. Obviously, a lot of people had a lot of follow-up questions, so it's great to see that engagement. So um, we will go ahead and close out today's session due to the time. Uh, if you do have further questions, you can email us or visit our website at acu.edu forward slash online or acuidlab.com. Thank you again for joining us today at ACU ID Lab, and we hope you have a blessed day. Thank you, Noelle.